Uh, Ed's been here at, for about a year at Georgia Tech, a little bit over a year. Uh, transferred over from University of Virginia, where he spent about nine years as a professor. Um, is that right, about nine? Seven. Seven, <laughs> seven to nine, more or less. Um, I joined his lab in, in uh, 2009, and since then we've been doing amazing work um, in microvascular modeling, bone tissue engineering, uh, local immune modulation, and things of that nature. In terms of training, uh, one thing that's really interesting, and I both have in common, is we went to the greatest university on earth, next to Georgia Tech, University of Maryland College Park, uh, where he did a uh, math degree. Uh, he went on from there to start his PhD at um, the university, or complete his PhD at the University of Pennsylvania uh, in materials science. And bioengineering. And yep. bioengineering. Yep. Uh, <laughs> went on to do a postdoctoral fellowship with, at the, UN, with the UNCF Mark mm -hmm. um, at the, I know this, uh, with Star Institute, That's right? right. Yep. There you go. <laughs> um, and uh, now he's here at Georgia Tech and is associate prof as an associate professor. Uh, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that we do in lab uh, on therapeutic angiogenesis uh, and bone regeneration with natural synthetic small molecules. So hopefully you enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Tony, for that very kind introduction. Uh, okay. So uh, I want to talk today about uh, some of our work in the study of and manipulation of signaling in the microvasculature and the degree to which perturbations to uh, interactions that some of these micro, the, the, the components of the microvasculature, particularly vascular endothelial cells on both the arterioles and venules and capillaries, as well as parasites I'll talk less about today. Uh, and, and smooth muscle cells kind of work together not only to supply uh, blood flow to uh, remodeling and regenerating tissues but can also uh, forge kind of a, a scaffolding for, for tissue regeneration in, in, in a wide uh, variety of, of contexts. And so what you're looking at here is kind of a, a mesenteric uh, microvascular network and I kind of prefer this image over some of the classic depictions of capillary beds just so that you can get at some of the, the, the kind of morphological complexity and the sprouting morphogenesis than all of the different cell fates that are being dynamically regulated and as a result of inflammation, as a result of injury, and in the course of uh, wound healing, uh, particularly in, in bone tissues that hopefully I'll have a chance to talk about. Um, uh, this sprouting morphogenesis in endothelium as well as some of the soluble factors that are secreted by endothelial cells that can help to localize certain cells uh, in regions that are uh, undergoing some type of remodeling or uh, that have been stimulated by injury or, or the presence of a biomaterial implant um, has been shown in a variety of, of animal models and embryonic models. This is actually just some actual human data, just you're seeing some of these filopodial extensions, the shedding of microparticles, and just uh, really just uh, a representation of just dynamic processes in endothelium that happen uh, uh, during uh, development that we can extract information from. Uh, another developmental model, I believe this was in uh, a zebrafish where you can look at uh, tied to uh, certain subtypes of macrophage populations and in association with this kind of microvascular network where you can see two endothelial sprouts and the point being that these, the, 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 the presence and the contact with these macrophage populations can help, help actually establish this new circuit. And so these macrophages are, are actually serving as a, as a guide for ongoing remodeling processes that uh, is also something that we can uh, make, take inference from and, and guide new, potentially new therapies and, and kind of uh, regenerative medicine. In addition, we have uh, the maturation of networks. This is uh, another picture uh, in a, a, a mouse spinal trapezius model, just showing you the, these, these parasites in contact with a, a, a capillary. Part of the processes that are necessary to, to stabilize this network after all of these complex and dynamic remodeling events so that you can actually sustain uh, kind of perfusion and, and, and function without uh, some of the effects of, of, of uh, uh, vascular permeability and inefficiency in the network that could hamper 
uh, regeneration. And interestingly, for those of us who are interested in, in cell-based therapies, and particularly stem cells, you know, the uh, stem cells are uh, some believe to, uh, mesenchymal adult stem cells or mesenchymal stem cells are some believe to be derived from the microvasculature from these kind of parasite niches and if you label mesenchymal stem cells and you inject them into different tissue contexts you can actually find many of them in these uh, perivascular morphologies much like native parasites do. And the point being is that we can take away from these uh, uh, developmental models and some of the animal models uh, uh, just uh, bits of information that can help us understand what remodeling processes are most relevant in the adult and how those things can be controlled and regulated to uh, achieve some therapeutic uh, purpose. The particular route that I'll be talking about uh, today is uh, small molecule uh, drug delivery. And I'll be talking about some of the particular signals that can be incorporated in tissue engineering constructs that can direct this process of vascular assembly in ways that we believe really harness the endogenous wound healing responses in ways that help tissues regenerate. And I'll be talking most specifically about the ways in which certain small molecules, both synthetic and natural, can regulate processes of monocyte and macrophage uh, trafficking in the microvasculature to promote tissue regeneration. And so uh, the, the class of molecules that I'll be focusing on hail from the, uh, the, these uh, sphingolipids, uh, but uh, more specifically, uh, sphingosine one uh, phosphate. The point being is that this isn't, I mean, this is kind of a, a my graphical representation of a very complex metabolic network that exists in every tissue that we could think about, but more importantly, um, uh, the, uh, the we can perturb this network with uh, an increasing array of uh, modulators. So we can take, uh, as you can see, the S1P is irreversibly degraded by S1P lyase. There are inhibitors to this compound. We also have agonists and antagonists of S1P receptors. There, there are five known S1P receptors. Um, uh, high affinity G-couple receptors. There are a wide range of selective agonists and antagonists that not only have an effect on S1P receptor signaling, they also have a dramatic effect on the metabolism because they compete for some of the same enzymes that are kind of maintained in this, you know, some call sphingolipid rheostat. And we can kind of tip this balance locally within tissues through drug delivery and implantation of, of biomaterials. And the reason that uh, we are particularly interested in this is that the, the concentration of sphingosine one phosphate in particular is tightly regulated between the blood and the kind of these, these perivascular spaces. S1P is, is a, uh, you can find it at about uh, in the micromolar range in the blood um, and, uh, and uh, micromolar range in the plasma and uh, at uh, m much lower levels in some of these perivascular niches. And the maintenance and perturbations of this gradient is associated with um, already a, a, a wide range of really important biological processes. So S1P receptor metabolism and signaling is really key in the egress of lymphocytes from the lymph node. There's actually a drug called FTY720 that I'll talk about today. Uh, that is marketed now, I think, under the name Gelinia, which is used for the treatment of relapsing, remitting multiple sclerosis. But oral uh, uh, delivery of this drug actually sequesters all of the lymphocytes into the lymph nodes and induces a form of immunosuppression or lymphopenia. Um, S1P receptors also are known as direct osteoclastic precursors from the bone surface. And so uh, uh, osteoclastic precursors can uh, follow an S1P gradient from active bone remodeling surfaces back into the bloodstream. Um, hematopoietic stem cells also uh, use S1P gradients to, uh, to, to, to uh, exit or to egress from extramedullary sites into uh, the lymph in kind of classic patterns of, of, of uh, recirculation in these tissues. And so these things are known and are uh, all areas of kind of active, ongoing investigation of how exactly this small molecule is, is playing a role in important biological processes. What we've done over the past several years um, 
I hope it's not nine yet, at least, but I, you know, who's, who's counting except for my students? But the, uh, so one of the things that we, we like to do uh, is we like to do intravital microscopy so that we can see active microvascular remodeling processes that are, uh, that are, are being perturbed by the presence of biomaterials. That biomaterial may also present some gradient in some known molecule. Many of you will be familiar with growth factor delivery strategies, which we've also done. But we'll be talking about some specific small molecules today that are perturbing this gradient of S1P that we spoke about. And the, you know, one, of the, one of the questions that has really intrigued us is how the presence of these altered S1P uh, uh, how altered S1P metabolism and S1P signaling in the proximity of biomaterial implants can impact the way in which these implants integrate into host tissues and, di and direct certain processes like angiogenesis and vascular maturation. And uh, I'll, I'll focus a little more specifically today on the, particularly this, this, this classic uh, wound healing or, or foreign body response that has been characterized by many people. I just took uh, one of our own professors here in a review written several years ago, but uh, this, this idea that monocyte macrophage populations are really the conductor of really complex processes that dictate how the, the, the fibrosis associated with so the presence of a biomaterial implant or how well a bone implant may inter integrate with osseous surfaces, or how effectively uh, we can uh, grow new microvascular networks when delivered in some type of a vehicle. The, the interactions of monocyte macrophage populations will become important. And by using these intravital microscopy, uh, these, 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 live cell, these live animal imaging models, we can get a pretty good resolution of kind of these uh, venules and the, the, the sprouting morphogenesis from these kind of adult tissue vessels in response to our therapy and in proximity to certain implants that we've placed in this environment. So um, uh, the, the, this idea of monocyte macrophage populations um, uh, is, is uh, uh, again, I, I think uh, many people kind of adhere to this idea that, that the, the activity of monocyte macrophages are one of the primary indicators of how well your implant is being tolerated. So if this were kind of a classic depiction of what happens after injury or, inflection, uh, or infection, you can see uh, neutrophil accumulation just kind of represented as a kind of a hypothetical maximum uh, within hours. Those neutrophils begin to die and shed microparticles that do a variety of things to condition the inflammatory environment in a way that will recruit monocytes and generate macrophages, but eventually will, will resolve itself under the best circumstances. But we also know that uh, one of the, cla the classic um, indicators of a chronic inflammatory stimulus where in regenerative medicine we would want to avoid is kind of the persistence of these monocyte macrophage populations in vivo, which has really given inflammation kind of a bad name in biomaterial circles. And you've probably heard this many times now where there's an increasing appreciation of the fact that inflammation is not simply something that we want to suppress so that we can get to the end of the wound healing cycle. There are actually some components of the inflammatory processes that are very constructive. And uh, that, I wouldn't have a hard time convincing many people. Uh, but what I'll be talking about today is uh, ways in which we can kind of tap into some of those more constructive and regenerative inflammatory signals by means of uh, S1P signaling. So this slide is kind of a graphical depiction of a whole wide range of data that I'm not going to present in detail today, but suffice it to say that we can take very well characterized biodegradable polymers like polylactic co glycolic acid that can, is available in a variety of different formulations. Its degradation rate can be tuned. Its hydrophobicity and its wettability can be tuned in ways that help us control the rate of, 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 of diffusion or release of a wide range of compounds. We focused on both sphingosine 1-phosphate itself as well as some uh, S1, S1P receptor targeted molecules. I've mentioned F2I720. I'll mention others 
as we go along. So those are the synthetic and natural uh, small molecules that I spoke about in the, in, in the title. And we've characterized how the polymer properties and the rates of degradation and the specific interactions that these, uh, these bioactive lipids have with this polymer can, can sustain the release out to days or weeks post implantation. And so although it's a small molecule, unlike many of the small molecules that you would may be familiar with in terms of drug delivery strategies, you would expect those molecules to be exhausted within hours or days. But we can actually sustain the release of small molecules from very simple polymeric matrices uh, s simply by kind of solvent casting and other more conventional forms of, of, of encapsulation. And we have some amount of tunability by nothing fancier than just selecting uh, different polymer vehicles. And we can put this uh, into our in vivo models and we can kind of study how we can expand both the density and the caliber of vessels that surround our implants. Um, and uh, to speak a little more specifically, just to give you a flavor of some of the things we've done without getting into uh, too much detail, uh, if you look at the arteriolar diameter uh, of the arterioles in, the, in kind of the peri-implant region, if you release S1P itself in certain concentrations, you can actually get significant increases in the luminal diameter of arterioles that surround your implant. You can do something quite similar by simply encapsulating an S1P lyase. And so at the presence of S1P lyase in an implant will prevent the degradation of S1P and you can actually maintain certain gradients of S1P from your implant in ways that we've also seen as kind of a, a pro-angiogenic or more precisely a pro-arteriogenic stimulus, that is to say the growing new or expanding existing arterioles. If you combine uh, the lyase inhibitor with S1P, you can get a suggestively additive effect in the growth response and you can also use a selective agonist of S1P receptors. So FTY720 is a selective agonist of S1P receptors 1 and 3 for the purposes of this presentation, although it's also, it also has activity at 4 and 5. But you can see that because FTY720 has a much longer half-life than S1P, and because it's selective for some of the receptors that I, I'll show you are more important in this process of microvascular growth and remodeling, you can actually get very robust responses in arterial or diameter enlargement by the local delivery of S1P receptor targeting drugs that you can measure by this intravital image. You also get, in addition to the arterial or diameter enlargement, you can actually get expansions in the mean area density of vessels surrounding your implant as well. And these are all things that uh, are, are kind of therapeutic objectives that we speak of often in the context of tissue engineering. Now, um, I want to talk today about um, some of the uh, uh, res studies that we've done recently to try to understand the mechanisms underlying this growth response that we see in response to kind of altered gradients in S1P signaling or the presence of selective agonists of S1P receptors in the context of drug delivery. So one of the first things we did several years ago is that we took dorsal skin for window chamber. Now this is a model where we're just pulling up the dorsal skin in a mouse and we're cutting down to the reticular dermis and we're putting, uh, we're affixing a, a, a window into that tissue and into that window we can actually place an implant that presents the gradient in our small molecule. And what we've done here is we wanted to know the presence of the surgery itself is a chronic inflammatory stimulus. Right? So how does the inflammatory condition of the tissue impact the ability of your S1P receptor targeting drugs to do its job at growing and stabilizing uh, microvascular uh, growth and expansion? And surprisingly, one of the things that we saw is that um, the, what, what you're seeing here is that if you implant immediately after surgery, you get, a, you, know, a, you, you get a growth response somewhat like what I showed you before. But if you wait seven days for that tissue to accumulate large numbers of leukocytes, and we've done measurements that 
you know, that this skin is crawling with uh, macrophages by, by seven days, okay? So you put your implant in, at that seven day time point, you actually see the most significant increases in arterial or diameter enlargement and increases in mean area density. That is to say, the drug works better when the tissue is more inflamed, which is somewhat opposite of what we believed. Now, we also did some multiplex cytokine profiling of tissues that have been uh, uh, in, in kind of the peri-implant region where we just uh, implanted PLAGA, so that's, this is 50-50 polylactic co-glycolic acid in this kind of dermal tissue. Uh, one is just an unloaded implant, another has FTY720, right? In the same loading ratios that produce the most robust, robust growth responses in, the, in terms of our intravital measurements, we actually see significant decreases in some of the cytokines that are associated with a chronic inflammatory stimulus, okay? So, um, as I, and, and this is you know, not as straightforward as it may seem because as I said before, inflammation is a necessary process in the normal wound healing cascade in every tissue, and so we're seeing dramatic regulation and in some cases reduction of some of the inflammatory cues that in early stages of wound healing are, are very important but we're still seeing more long-term indications of, of enhances in microvascular growth and remodeling. So what you're seeing here is dramatic reductions in TNF and MIB, RANTES, IL-6 um, and uh, so we wanted to understand what exactly was going on here, right? So why are we seeing both a taming of chronic inflammatory cues in addition to what we consider to be pro-regenerative signals, right? So this is some of the work that uh, my illustrious senior graduate student, uh, Tony Awajaru, has been uh, focused on for the, the, the past couple of years. And so for those of you who may not be familiar with this idea, um, you know, a monocyte is not a monocyte, right? So there are, you know, many believe subsets of monocytes that exist in circulation that can be identified by collections of different uh, markers on their surface. And so what you're seeing here is that um, the, the certain subsets have been characterized as kind of pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory monocyte subsets. That is to say that these, the, these monocytes produce or secrete some of the signals that one would associate with kind of tissue deterioration and a chronic inflammatory stimulus, although that doesn't make them bad. Um, and these monocytes actually uh, are, are associated with the generation of, of things like VEGF and other uh, cytokines and growth factors that you would associate with wound healing. You may also be familiar with the idea that once these monocytes have extravasated into tissues, they're also categorizations of different uh, macrophage populations. Uh, the, there's kind of, in, I guess in the simplest depiction, you have M1 classically activated macrophages, and here are some of the things that uh, M1 macrophages are associated with. And, um, and uh, all, all in, the, in a tissue engineering context, all things that we would certainly want to control if not avoid. Um, and here we have these alternatively activated uh, macrophage populations and you know I'll, I, I will wade gently into the controversy about whether anti-inflammatory monocytes give rise to alternatively activated M2 macrophages although I'm not ready to kind of stake a definitive claim on it but I, I'm aware that there's a controversy many of you may have your own opinions but to the extent that you accept that there are subtypes in blood and subcategories of macrophages that exist in tissues that are known to play significant roles in things that we want to control, we're attempting to study those things and understand the degree to which uh, S1P signaling may be uh, exploitable, if that's a word. Um, so we can uh, isolate from blood, from bone marrow, from spleen, uh, these different subtypes. So here, um, we're, this is a, a kind of an, an image stream uh, flow cytometer, something I'm just highlighting because we desperately need to get this here at Georgia Tech some way. Um, but you know, we can identify 
pop these populations of cells and we can sort them and we can begin to understand how they might in, how they might respond to uh, some of the cues that we're presenting uh, by uh, release of S1P uh, targeted drugs. So in this case, we just took your anti-inflammatory monocytes and your inflammatory monocytes and we said, okay, let's just hit these guys with uh, FTY 720. And so uh, for the purposes of this discussion, S uh, consider FTY 720 a selective agonist of S1P receptors 1 and 3. And we wanted to compare the, uh, the secretion of these <coughs> pro-inflammatory, uh, uh, this pro-inflammatory panel that I showed you from tissue e extracts. We wanted to compare what the production rates of these uh, mediators were from the cells themselves in vitro, okay? And so in this case, we actually, uh, and, uh, we actually compared it to another compound called SCW2871. This is a selective one agonist compound. And what we're seeing is that relative to the one agonist compound, this FTY720, and particularly compounds that are agonists of S1P receptor 3, we began to see were very highly correlated with these suppressive inflammatory effects, okay? So not only am I showing you kind of a, a confirmation of the activity of FTY 720 and suppressing some of the pro-inflammatory mediator production uh, in both the anti-inflammatory and inflammatory subsets, I'm also showing you that it, the, uh, there is a, a, a significantly greater effect uh, by compounds that are targeting S1P receptor 3, uh, something that I'll uh, come back to. And that is because if, if we take uh, the, the, if we take the, uh, uh, out of, we, we extract from the mouse, as I showed you, anti-inflammatory monocytes and inflammatory monocytes, we began to see that the anti-inflammatory subset was overexpressing uh, S1P uh, receptor 3. So here we're showing it in a western blot, uh, and we're also showing that the uh, amount of S1P receptor 3 expression was actually increased by incubation with FTY720. So the drug we're using that's an agonist of S1P receptor 3 was increasing the level of expression and the basal expression levels were higher in the anti-inflammatory subsets overall. If you look at the message by RT-PCR, you also see significantly uh, greater uh, expression of the S1P receptor 3 at the mRNA level and uh, no distinction between the expression levels of S1P receptor 1. If you look at murine, so if we take a murine macrophage cell line and we, we use cocktails to polarize these macrophages into this classic M1 and M2 macrophage uh, phenotype, we actually see a similar pattern in that we see higher levels of expression in uh, the, what I'll call the wound healing macrophages of S1P receptor 3 and you know virtually no changes in S1P receptor 1. And so what this top panel is showing you is that uh, these anti-inflammatory monocytes and some of these, alter, these alternatively activated macrophage populations are overexpressing uh, S1P receptor 3, uh, um, uh, S1P receptor 3. And this is also the case in uh, this human uh, 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 monocyte cell line that we polarized to uh, these M0, the M1 and M2 macrophages as well. So you're seeing here higher uh, surface expression of S1P receptor 3 uh, in, the, in the M2 macrophage subset. Then we took those cells, still in vitro, and we said, okay, what are some of the cues that may be upregulated uh, in tissues that are, under, that, that are regenerating. And SDF1 is a popular choice for reasons that I'll come back to in just a second. But we, what we showed is that the anti-inflammatory subset uh, was, uh, showed significantly greater SDF1 chemotaxis than did the uh, inflammatory subset. And we also showed that FTY720 here again, so agonist of S1P receptor 3, actually enhance SDF1 chemotaxis. And we also showed that in comparison to a S1P receptor 1 agonist 
we don't see this effect. And so again, we're showing that agonist of S1, so activation of S1P receptor 3, we're associating with enhanced chemotaxis to known regenerative cytokines. And we also wanted to check to see whether, okay, does exposure to FTY720 and activation of S1P receptor 3, does it change the phenotype of the monocyte or macrophage populations from, does it shift them from inflammatory to anti-inflammatory? And the answer is no. We don't see any evidence that FTY720 is switching inflammatory monocytes to the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the anti-inflammatory phenotype. So what this suggests is that if there is a mechanism of immunoregulation leading to enhanced regeneration, it's likely through this recruitment mechanism with, uh, some, with, with, with growth factors and chemokines that are present in the tissue. And so, um, uh, the, just as, as to, to further convince ourselves that this is S1P receptor 3 mediated, uh, the, the S1P receptor 3 knockout mouse is viable. And so we took the S1P, we, we harvested anti-inflammatory monocytes and inflammatory monocytes from S1P receptor 3 knockout animals. And we did the same experiment where we exposed them to an agonist of S1P receptor 3 and we no longer see the increase in SDF chemotaxis. And so that kind of further convinced us that we're really looking at the activation of S1P receptor 3 as a pro-regenerative stimulus. Now we wanted to look a little more specifically at some of the uh, what's going on in tissues. And so uh, this is a complicated slide, but just uh, these are some of the cocktails that are, are known to induce these specific macrophage uh, populations. I only talked about M1 and M2 for simplicity. For those of you who are kind of more familiar with this concept, you'll know that there are actually subcategories within M2 that uh, play uh, different roles. We're mostly interested in M2A and C in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in our case. And we're going to use, um, I'll, I'll kind of point out some of the markers that we'll use to distinguish these macrophage subsets when they come up in our histology. Okay, so now, um, uh, does S1P receptor 3 play a role in the generation of regenerative signals that are present in tissues? And so, in this case, we wanted to take endothelial cells and we did our same multiplex cytokine profile, but in this case, instead of looking at the pro-inflammatory cytokines, we actually looked at a collection of what we considered to be pro-regenerative cytokines. And again, we see significant increases in the generation of pro-regenerative growth factors and chemokines by the activation of S1P receptor 3. Now, why do we think it's S1P receptor 3? Because we compare it to an S1P receptor 1 agonist compound, and we don't see this same regenerative effect. In addition, we also have a compound here called VPC0091. This is a S1P receptor 3 antagonist. And so for this one, we did an ELISA for SDF1, and we showed that the uh, the pharmacological inhibition of S1P receptor 3 dramatically reduced the production of SDF1 itself from endothelial cells. And so what we believe is that by uh, releasing compounds that are targeting S1P receptor 3 and activating them in tissues, we are increasing the production of pro-regenerative cues and increasing the sensitivity of wound healing macrophages and anti-inflammatory monocyte subsets to those cues. And so we're harnessing inflammation in ways that we think can promote regeneration. And to prove that, we, did, we went back to our intravital microscopy model. And in this case, we took CX3CR1 EGFP mice. And so 90% um, uh, of the monocytes are constitutively labeled in, the, in, the, uh, in, 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 this, in this green uh, mouse here. And so, um, what, and if you look at, um, I, I dare not show movies right now in, uh, because I, I, I felt like I was having bad luck this morning, sorry. Um, but the, uh, but you'll, you'll have to trust me that we have a variety of, of, of uh, intravital assessments or real-time tracking of these CX3CR1 high cells that are associated with the uh, anti-inflammatory subset. And what we see is, 
Although we see an overall reduction in total numbers of leukocytes, particularly monocytes, uh, that are flowing, rolling, and adherent when we are delivering FTY720, if you look at the mean fluorescence intensity of cells that are being recruited, this is, I think, one hour and uh, this is 24 hours. By 24 hours in vivo, the mean fluorescence intensity of CX3CR1 per cell is significantly higher in the cases where we've delivered FTY720. And so what we believe is this is evidence that we're actually uh, selectively recruiting anti-inflammatory subsets from the circulation into uh, these cutaneous tissues. And if you look at, if, if you use the whole slew of markers, so CX3CR1 is one of the accepted markers of the, that, that, that allow distinctions of anti-inflammatory and inflammatory monocyte subsets. If you uh, uh, do uh, combinations of markers, some of which I kind of outlined in a previous slide, you actually do see suggestive increases in the uh, anti-inflammatory subsets in response to FTY720 and reductions in the inflammatory subsets, okay? And if you do histology, and so these are histological sections uh, of, of the dorsal skin that have, that's been either uh, of the peri-implant region that of, of where we just have PLGA or PLGA releasing FTY720. This MHC2 is kind of a, a classic M1 uh, marker and what we see is you're seeing more positive staining for macrophages that are uh, that are expressing some of these M1 uh, kind of classically inflammatory markers in the case where we just have PLAGA and lower levels when we use FTY720. Conversely, CD206 is an M2, particularly an M2A and an M2C macrophage marker. You actually see significantly more staining in the cases where you uh, were releasing FTY720. And so we think that this, uh, th this, this regulation or this selective recruitment of these anti-inflammatory monocytes is at least correlated with the increased infiltration or differentiation of, 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 of wound healing or, anti or, uh, or alternatively activated macrophages. So now, um, there are a lot of competing ideas about how this process is happening. So if you accept the idea that we can increase the numbers of anti-inflammatory monocytes that enter tissues as a result of the pharmacological activation of S1P receptor 3 or other S1P receptor 3 drugs. If you believe that, one of the competing ideas about why we would see that is not that we're enhancing the recruitment of those cells from the circulation. The com the, the, one of the more popular competing hypotheses is that we're actually recruiting you know, a monocyte, right? So a monocyte is a monocyte, but the local microenvironment is conditioning that monocyte to exhibit one of these so-called inflammatory, anti-inflammatory phenotypes, right? So we wanted to see whether there was some indication uh, of, of where, where, that that's true in our case. And so we did an adoptive transfer experiment where we isolated um, inflammatory monocytes from the spleen. I don't know where we got it from. I, I, I assume we got it from blood and spleen or bone marrow. Bone marrow, all right. So we isolated uh, the inflammatory monocytes from the bone marrow. We label them with a lipophilic dye, so dye I, so we can know uh, what the donor inflammatory monocytes were. And you can put these cells into the circulation of a host mouse, and those cells will be viable for several days, right? So then, uh, after we did the adoptive transfer, we did our backpack surgery. In certain cases, we put in PLGA, or our implant, our degradable polymer. In another case, we put our degradable polymer in, but the, uh, that polymer is releasing this, pro, this, this immunomodulatory drug, FTY720. So what we're looking for is some indication, right? If, so if, if the microenvironment is conditioning the monocyte to exhibit some of these alternative phenotypes, right, you would expect to see some of the dye I label cells 
exhibiting uh, the marker expression that we associate with the anti-inflammatory subset. You follow? So, um, so this isn't showing up all that well, but here are some montages of the uh, of of the uh, of, of an implant in the uh, backpack, right? So what you're seeing these uh, these little orange patches around the implant here. So those are our dye-I labeled inflammatory monocytes, right? Or these are at least dye-I labeled cells, right? And here is our FTY case. There are some. Uh, 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 orange or dye eye label cells that are present in both these peri implant regions. It appears to us at this point, this is something we haven't quantified rigorously, it appears to us that many of these dye eye label cells, these inflammatory monocytes, are actually uh, on, in, in contact with the interface of the material, whereas we see them more diffuse in the FTY 720 case. But more importantly, what we don't see, if you just count cells from the intravital images, we don't see any indication of greater numbers of our uh, dye-I label cells in the case where we have FTY 720. And if you actually look at the, the classic marker combinations that distinguish anti-inflammatory and inflammatory subsets, so um, in the interest of time, just let's look at this tissue level um, uh, expression. We don't see, uh, so we don't see an indication of higher numbers of dye-I labeled or dye-I positive anti-inflammatory monocyte cells. So in our hands, we're not seeing an indication of the transdifferentiation, if you will, of inflammatory monocytes that we have donated to a, a new animal uh, uh, and to uh, anti-inflammatory monocytes. Um, and so, uh, in, in, in to kind of further support this idea that it's a recruitment mechanism, we did a, we, we generated a, a, a mouse, a bone marrow mouse chimera. So as I told you, the S1P receptor 3 uh, knockout mouse is viable. So what we did was we lethally irradiated a mouse, we reconstituted with bone marrow that was deficient in S1P receptor 3, right? And what we wanted to see was whether we could basically to do a loss of function experiment. That is to say, now in, the, in this chimera where the circulating cells, so the cells that are in the blood, if they lack S1P receptor 3, can you still produce the uh, growth response to, uh, in response to FTY 720? And you can't. And if we, if we, um, uh, if we reconstitute with wild type marrow that has S1P receptor 3, you, you, we can uh, increase both the mean area density as well as the uh, arterial or diameter enlargement. But we did the reverse experiment as well. So we took an S1P3 knockout mouse, we lethally irradiated it, and we reconstituted with wild type bone marrow. So in this case, the bone marrow cells that we say are being recruited into the tissue, they have S1P receptor 3, and they can respond to FTY720. But um, in this case, the, but the local cells, the local host cells, they don't have S1P receptor 3. And we couldn't recover the function. So that suggests to us that there's some type of reciprocal signaling going on that is somewhat consistent with what we showed earlier. So I showed you that FTY 720 in vitro, when stimulating uh, endothelial cells, was increasing the production of pro-regenerative cytokines. So it could be that you not only need the local recruitment of these cells from circulation, but you also need the local production of certain uh, kind of uh, cooperating or, or partnering uh, chemokines in order to produce the, the, the regenerative response that uh, is of greatest interest to us. So what I'm going to do now in the interest of, uh, of, of time is um, I'm going to make uh, I'm going to wave my hands and make two other claims for slides that I won't have time to go over in detail, and then I'm going to show you uh, what some of the implications are for what we've shown thus far in more kind of classic uh, regenerative medicine models, particularly in bone. So I'm going to show you some kind of bone healing data, mainly because it's in the title. <laughs> 
But um, so in, in support of this idea that uh, in support of this idea that S one P sorry in support of this idea that S one P receptor three may be playing a role in stimulating endothelial cells to produce pro-regenerative cytokines, we have taken a look using microfluidics. And so uh, this is kind of a, we have, we, we have uh, in this case, this is a, a, a static uh, uh, microfluidic uh, culture model. In this case, I guess it's not fluidic, but we, we put endothelial cells around these posts. Some of you will be familiar with this model because uh, uh, Roger Cam and uh, has kind of popularized this particular design and we've used it in our laboratory for the last year or so. And basically you can see, uh, you, you can get a good quantitative picture of sprouting morphogenesis in endothelial cells in response to uh, vascular endothelial growth factor. Mm -hmm. If you stimulate those cells with FTY720, you actually see a suppression, a suppression of a lot of that sprouting morphogenesis. If you actually use uh, a, a, a pharmacological inhibitor. So the, these two compounds differ by the fact that one is an agonist of S1P receptor 3 and another is an antagonist. And we actually see a recovery of the sprouting morphogenesis in, these, uh, in both Huvex, uh, so venous cells, in addition to these, these Hague cells or these arterial cells. And so this is kind of supporting the idea that, that S1P receptor 3 is playing a role not only in some of the uh, kind of what I'll call angiocrine signaling production, so the production of certain regenerative chemokines that may play important roles to recruit endogenous cells, it may also be playing a significant role in directing processes in remodeling in the vascular network. We, are, we see actually a, quite a similar story when we induce the sprouting uh, by uh, underflow. So both static VEGF stimulation in addition to kind of flow stimulated endothelial sprouting in this particular model suggests that S1P receptor 3 is also playing a role in the sprouting morphogenesis and, like, and it's very likely the production of certain angiocrine like stimulus or soluble factors from the endothelial cells. So I'm not going to develop that quite as much. Um, so the, um, before I try, so the, the, so the one thing that I think ties this story together that I did want to touch on is, um, so how exactly is it, where are these anti-inflammatory cells going? And, uh, and, 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 and what about these gradients that I talked about before, right? I mean, are, 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 are the cells really seeing a local gradient that can localize them to important regions in some type of perturbed tissue? So I'm using a different model now. So this is a mouse spinal trapezius assay. So this is a back stabilizer muscle in a mouse. It's, we're not taking intravital images anymore. We're actually taking these whole mounted sections out, but the, but the real advantage here is that we can take the, uh, we, can take, we can see this whole microvascular network without the need to do any kind of histology. And because we can do it in a mouse, we can uh, use a, a variety of transgenics that we have on hand. So in this case, our collaborators, uh, particularly uh, Shane Pierce Kotler at UVA, kind of affectionately calls this the, the Christmas mouse. And so uh, this is a cross of an NG2, uh, 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 an, uh, an NG2 red uh, CX3 CR1 EGFP uh, mouse. And so all of your, you know, your, your parasites and your smooth muscle cells are going to be red. Some of your, you know, uh, the, the, your monocyte populations are going to be green. And so, you know, it kind of looks like Christmas, right? Red, green. And then just for good measure, we threw, we threw some blue in here. So we did lectin staining of endothelium. So endothelium's blue. Uh, NG2, or smooth muscle, is red outlining some of the more mature vessels, and then you have uh, CX3CR1. That is one of the indicators of this anti-inflammatory uh, subset. And what you're seeing is that we've done this both uh, by, by virtue of the density and both the proximity. The, the CX3CR1 high cells we find in proximity to the most actively remodeling watersheds in the network. And so you can do this just by virtue of putting an implant in. You can also do this by doing upstream ligation here into this network so you can create kind of a, a watershed of a mild ischemia, which is also associated with the um, uh, increased production of SDF1, by the way. But uh, in this case, you actually see 
um, the, the cells actually, the, uh, that, that are adopting this kind of perivascular-like niche. And just to convince ourselves that this, may, this is associated with a, a, a selective recruitment of some of these subtypes that I spoke about earlier, in this case we did CD206 staining, and what you're seeing here is you can actually see the extravagant, well, I'm, I'm speculating here, but what I think you're seeing is the extravasation of CX3CR1 cells from this post-capillary venial, and you can see them being recruited to these arterioles. And the idea, we, we think, is that one of the ways in which FTY720 is inducing this remodeling process and microvascular network expansion is by selective recruitment of these cells that not only are generating a paracrine stimulus, but they're actually doing so in specific perivascular regions that are, that, that I think make their, uh, that, are, that, are, that render them uh, of, of greatest effect uh, or greatest benefit in the context of regeneration. And overall, the vast majority of CX3CR1 positive cells are directly in association with vessels, right? So if you just look at total numbers of cells, in the case where we have delivered FTY 720, it's pulling those cells toward the vessels themselves. <laughs> All right, we've, uh, Manuel like this, we did a model, and the model's very stable. And, uh, <laughs> we, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the model actually allows us to make a certain, uh, we, we're drawing an inference from it, okay? You'll have to trust me, the eigenvalues are all okay, Manu. But, the, uh, uh, but, the, the, but inflammatory stimulus in endothelial cells actually results in the kind of the shunting, we call it, or the, this, this, this significant increase this transient increase in S1 P production. And we actually think that this shunting effect of inflammation may be one of the things that are actually serving to localize those cells once they've extravasated to some of the more active remodeling microvascular networks. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have time to develop that too much more. And I'm going to skip the sickle cell stuff entirely. OK. So several slides on bone, and then I'll quit. OK. So now. You know, I've showed you a, uh, a microvascular network model. You can see microvascular network expansions. Does this have an impact on the rates in which certain tissues that we're interested in heal? I'm very interested in bone tissue engineering in particular. It's still a very clinically and medically significant problem. We need new technologies that can enhance uh, the integration of bone implant materials with host bone and can increase the production of new bone in spaces where there may be some bone void. In this case, we've actually created PLGA nanofibers that are encapsulating FTY 720. Um, and we've uh, put those in our backpack model. And we've done some of the same things we showed before. But we're showing you here that we're, we're seeing reductions in fibrosis. And we're seeing significant increases in the recruitment of macrophage populations that we would consider to be these uh, anti-inflammatory, or these uh, alternatively activated or M2-like uh, macrophages. Um, uh, if you take bone marrow aspirate and you treat it with FTY720 and you do a chemotaxis assay to SDF1, you actually see significant increases in the chemotaxis of mesenchymal stem cells from the bone marrow. And so uh, FTY720 is also enhancing the kind of the, the chemokine response of certain cells that are bone progenitors. Uh, and, uh, and, and by the way, the FTY 720 was presented from kind of a nanofiber surface. As a consequence, if you, we created a, a, a critical size mandibular defect in a rat. We put the nanofiber mesh on. And then we did uh, microfill, contrast enhanced micro CT. And we saw significant increases in vascularization. Uh, particularly in some of these medium caliber uh, vessels in the regenerate bone tissue. And most importantly, we saw very significant increases in the amount of new bone that's actually formed in this tissue defect in the case where we're delivering FTY 720 from these nanofibers. And uh, that increase is kind of borne out on some of the histological sections that we've taken. But more importantly, and I'll stop here, more importantly, we're seeing kind of a consistent story 
in that these, the, these inflammatory monocytes are filling, or sorry, these uh, M1 macrophages are filling the regenerate tissue in the non-healing nanofiber alone case, but we see much more significant uh, 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 numbers of these alternatively activated or M2 macrophages in the regenerate bone tissue where we've delivered FTY720. And so we think that this, this strategy of enhancing uh, uh, of the, or really tapping into the kind of host inflammatory response is going to play itself out in similar ways in other tissues uh, as we certainly think it does in bone. So uh, I just want to uh, thank everyone here. I, I got to get a new slide and do maybe, we got to do more word art at Georgia Tech with some of the new people. But I kind of gave uh, Tony his shout out as well. Molly's not in the picture, so I'm like double, I feel doubly bad, but uh, <laughs> Molly Ogle, my postdoc of uh, a few months here, has actually done yeoman's or yeoman's work, I don't know what you call it, uh, also uh, in, in producing a lot of this data. Some of the uh, mandibular defect data as well um, was, was done by uh, Claire Seeger, who may or may not be here, uh, in, in cooperation with Anasuya Das, who, look, they're making the age, so they, they actually partnered in... There's no H in mandibular, though. That, that would have been convenient. But um, I also, uh, <laughs> also want to thank uh, my uh, funding sources, particularly uh, NIAMS, uh, NIDCR, NSF, and thank you for the opportunity to present today. I was kind of curious when you were talking about the, the appearance of these um, alternative activated or the M2 macrophages around the blood vessels and wondering if you've looked at the endothelial cells at all and the effect of your agonist on uh, the S1P receptor 3 on endothelial cells to see if they're reducing their inflammatory response in terms of increased ICAM-1 or the adhesion molecules that monocytes would use to get the, the well, tissue or anything like that. So are you in vivo or in vitro? So we, we've done some in vitro uh, measurements of some of the cytokines, the, the multiplex analysis I, I, I talked about a bit. I don't, I feel like we may have tried adhesion markers at one point, but I don't think we saw any kind of differential regulation that I'm aware of. So, um, I mean, it's an area of kind of ongoing investigation for us, but we haven't done any in vivo staining for any of those markers or anything like that yet, or at least nothing that's worked. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and if I say that, it really didn't work, because I hate those words in my lab. Anyway. Uh, Dr. Lawrence, you Some of the effects that you have re re resemble what might happen if resolvents were being modulated. Yeah. Has anybody looked to see if there is any uh, relate between S1P or the S1P receptor resolvents? <sighs> Not to my knowledge, but I mean that that's that's certainly an area that we're interested in. I, you know, the, um, the I would say two things to that. Number one is, you know, we have one of the things I didn't have a chance to show is that we think that you know um, uh, the that S one P uh, stimulation and some of these uh, compounds that we're using are playing some role in microparticle generation from neutrophils and other kind of uh, cells that. I, are, are that uh, some of the microparticles that, that carry higher levels of resolvent, so we think that there may be a connection there. Um, uh, but in terms of more uh, direct connections between S1P and resolvents, uh, we haven't, we're not aware of any to, to date. Yeah. So I finally got the whole S1P3 story now. Let's think it all put together. Uh, but then, uh, so what are the other factors that could be from the tissue that would be recruiting these cells? Like, and, and how do you guys have a way that you're thinking about testing that? The other factors from the tissue that could be, other than SDF, you're saying? Right. Or that when you did the S1P3 reconstitution. Right. Those oh, you're, yeah, you're hung up on that, too. Yeah, I mean, the, so, I mean, I really wish the, you know, restoration of function experiment had worked because it would be a simpler story. Yeah. But you know, if you're going to claim some reciprocity, then I think your question is a fair one. You know, what signals are kind of most responsible for actually directing those cells to where they go? We've really focused on SDF1, uh, CXCR4 SDF1 uh, right now, and 
Well, do you think there's any, you know, because the S1P3 mouse was kind of grown without S1P3, do you think there's been any kind of adaptive circuitry that's been changed such that even when you put in wild type, they don't have the other things in place? Yeah, I mean, I, as far as I know, the S1P3 mouse doesn't have a phenotype that we know about. Slightly reduced bone density, but no other phenotype. So, um, but, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's very, I mean, as you know, we have interest in hematopoietic stem cells. <laughs> so, I mean, so, part, so to make a long story short, what we think is that S1P3 is playing a significant role in maintaining the hematopoietic stem cell niche. When you knock it out, you see higher numbers of SCA1 and LSK cells in the blood, and you can inhibit it pharmacologically. You can mobilize more hematopoietic stem cells into blood. So, I mean, I think that, you know, to the extent that FTY 720 is regulating a microenvironmental niche involving multiple cells and factors, certainly these localization cues to a vascular niche, at least in the hematopoietic stem cell context, S1P receptor 3 is playing a significant role. Most of, and again, most of what we've done is really focused on CX3, CR4, but in terms of kind of any kind of adaptive responses in the absence of S1P receptor 3, we haven't. We haven't really seen anything. Yeah. Um, I'm very interested in your last part related to bone regeneration. Mm -hmm. uh, my question becomes, what's the advantage of your approach, S1P-based approach, compared to like conventional method? What's the conventional method for like selectively growth, recruiting? Like growth factor. No, not recruiting yeah. uh, mega, modern size or mega Or like B and Ps. Right, right. OK. Well, I mean, I, I think that, you know, Around here, I'm sure you've seen multiple people make reference to the fact that BMPs, you know, have generated a certain amount of controversy surrounding some adverse events uh, like ectopic bone formation, you know, chronic inflammation, and things like that. So, I think that, you know, in the context of bone, I think this is more of what I would call an endogenous tissue engineering strategy, where you're actually harnessing, you know, host cues to enhance regeneration, which has some appeal. But beyond that, I think if you look, part of the you know, reason I'm here, frankly, is that I think that if you look at the, in the cardiovascular realm, you know, things like you know, MI, stroke, uh, even you know, spinal cord, which we're beginning to look at, um, the, 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 the balance of anti-inflammatory cell recruitment and the activities of M2 macrophages play a really significant role in the outcomes of regeneration in those other tissue contexts in ways that I think others have shown much more definitively than I think than anything that exists in bone right now. So the hope is that if we can define pathways of molecular regulation and selective recruitment of some of these therapeutic cells, it can be applied in other contexts effectively. But you know, our lab historically has not been big on you know, heart attack and stroke models, but it's something that we hope to do. Well, you know, I, I, and so it's interesting, like all the questions are like my last six slides which I flew over, but the, um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, the, uh, what we were attempting to show with the contact angle measurements is this idea that, you know, S1P is kind of amphiphilic. So you've got this polar head, right, or, and some of the S1P drugs as well kind of have this polar head. And, w you know, our, our belief was that PLGA is going to be largely hydrophobic and so what we think is that that nonpolar tail is kind of going to bury in the polymer bulk, and you're going to kind of decorate these head groups onto the polymer surface. And that if you look at, like, Avanti Polar Lipids and other companies can actually, actually sell these amplifiles that supposedly can modify nano, nanospheres and microspheres and it, basically exploiting some of the same property, right? So, so what we're trying to show is that by virtue of altered wettability and contact angle, it's supporting the idea that we're, we're, we're modifying that material surface, right? What we haven't showed is that the, the uh, orientation of FTY's presentation 
and or its modification of biomaterial surfaces itself is having a direct effect on cells that come in contact with that implant. Although I think as your question suggests, that is quite possible. But to date, we've really just focused on the idea that we're getting and sustaining a diffusive gradient of FTY that is altering these recruitment events. But I think that, um, uh, but that's certainly an, an, an area that we are continuing to look at. All right, so, <laughs> all right, so the answer is I don't know. So FTY is almost, FTY is going to reduce osteoclastic activity. So part of what we are seeing could be a result of just, you know, less bone resorption, right? FTY is going to enhance uh, microvascular growth and remodeling. Angiogenesis is going to support the growth of new bone. FTY is going to enhance the recruitment of bone progenitor cells from the local microenvironment and from the circulation, presumably, because other cells have S1P receptor 3 and work I didn't have a chance to show you. So, you know, I mean, the, so the good news to me is that all of the, our speculated, you know, mechanisms of FTY, S1P receptor 3 agonist effects in the context of bone all of them would enhance bone, right? Bone formation, which is one of our goals. To be able to distinguish the respective effects of them is something that we haven't been able to do. But that is partly the reason why, you know, hopefully it came across that we use multiple models, some of which are focused on visualizing actual single cell recruitment events and what those cells do, some of which are focused on whole network remodeling and where the, what the spatial relationships are between cells that are recruited and the microvascular network, some of which are in the kind of orthotopic bone regeneration context proper. And what, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to make inferences based on the preponderance of the evidence that emerges from looking at it in all those different ways. But I don't know that there'll be a time where I can say, you know, it's angiogenesis or, you know, it's stem cell recruitment. Although, you know, who knows? Computational model. Computational model. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>